You've taken care of your patient for 12 hours. You drew labs. You spoke to the family. You took your patient downstairs for an MRI and you started their tube feeding, etc. So you did all those things, but do you actually know what to say in your bedside shift report? Welcome everyone to the Mama Nurse channel. I'm Vanessa and here we discuss all things nursing, motherhood, and lifestyle. Make sure you leave a like on this video. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and make sure you hit that notification bell so that you don't miss out on any uploads. So when it comes to bedside shift report, what do you actually need to say? What is the oncoming nurse looking for? And how do you avoid getting yelled at? During my eight or nine plus years as a registered nurse, starting out as a med surge nurse to now trauma surgical ICU, and from a staff nurse to now a travel and local travel nurse, I have learned some of the key points that most oncoming nurses are looking for. It feels like they received a good bedside shift report or bedside handoff. Keep in mind, each report and each handoff, depending on your setting, may be a little bit different. But if you follow this standard structure, there shouldn't be any oncoming nurses that would be upset with the information that you get. Now, it's nursing, it's healthcare. You will always have a few who just may not be happy, and that's okay. But continue to follow this structure so that you can give an efficient and consistent bedside shift report or bedside handoff. Do you have bed three today? Okay, are you ready for report? So in bed three, we have Miss Jane Doe Rover. She is a 22-year-old female, no known allergies, full code, and she was admitted on 9-1 as a level two trauma. The patient was riding her bike and she was hit by a car at about 15 miles per hour. The patient states she has no past medical history. Now let's get into the systems. Neurowise, she's anno times three, moves all, follows all commands. Her pupils are perla three and brisk. Cardiac wise, she's sinus rhythm. Her blood pressure is stable, but her goal is to keep her systolic less than 140. Her T max was 100.0. Respiratory wise, she is on room air, lung sounds are clear. GIGU, she voids on the bedpan, and she voided three times for me today. She has not had a bowel movement since admission, and she's currently NPO pending neurosurgery clearance. We are doing Q6 blood sugar checks on her and she's been in the low 100s. Skin, she has a bruise to her left flank, her left eye, and abrasions on her left knee that are open to air. She has not had any procedures since admission. Lying, she has a 20 gauge in her right AC and a 20 gauge in her right hand. Drip, she currently has NS running at 100 ml per hour. She does have a mom, her name is Deb, here is her contact information. The DC plan is for her to return home with mom. The only thing pending for her currently is to contact neurosurgery to start a diet. Her labs were unremarkable, nothing to replace by the electrolyte protocol, and her neurosurgeon is Dr. Brain. Do you have any questions for me? Do you also have the patient in bed one? Okay, this one is a little bit more complex. Are you ready? In bed one, we have John Doe Complex. He is a 90-year-old male, allergy to codeine and penicillins, and he is a full code. He got admitted on 9-4 as a level one trauma. The patient was a restrained driver and was T-boned on the right side in a rollover accident at about 50 miles per hour. He did lose consciousness and his GCS was three at the scene. Injuries. He had a C5, C6 fracture, an epidural hematoma, a pelvic fracture, a right femur fracture, a frontal SDH, a SDH is a subdural hematoma. He had a left temporal non-displaced fracture and a right pneumo. His left temporal fracture was non-operative. Medical history, he has hypertension, COPD, diabetes, heart stents times three, and an MI in the past. Neurowise, we are doing Q1 hour neuro checks. He does have an Aspen collar that is to remain in place at all times. P3 
Pupils are pinpoint and non-reactive. The doctors are aware. He does not follow commands and he only withdraws to pain. If he were to get up out of bed, he is non-weight bearing to the right lower extremity per PT. Cardiac wise, he is in AFib uncontrolled in the high 140s. He has been hypertensive and the goal is to keep his blood pressure less than 160. The patient is febrile. His Tmax for me was 104.3 and he is on a cooling blanket. For his AFib, we are running Amio at 0.5 and for his blood pressure, we are running Cardine, currently running at 10. Since we're talking about drifts, I'll give you the rest of them now. He also has LR running at 75 mLs per hour, fentanyl at 150 and Presidex at 3. Respiratory wise, he was intubated in the field. He has a number 8 ET tube and it's at 21 centimeters at the lip. His current vent settings, he's on AC, PRVC, rate of 14, 450 for his tidal volume, 8 of PEEP, and 70%. They attempted CPAP trials, but he failed. The patient does have copious secretions. They are yellow and very thick. He also has a right chest tube. It's to negative 20 of suction. I had an output of 100 mLs. GIGU, he has a Foley, it put out 825 mLs for me and it is concentrated. His last bowel movement was on 9-7, it was large brown but loose. He has a right near NG tube to low intermittent wall suction and I got 200 mLs of bile colored output. His abdomen does have hypoactive bowel sounds. We are at doing Q4 blood sugars. He's been in the low 100s, high 90s, and he is currently NPO except meds. Procedures on 9-4, they did do an X fix for his pelvis. On 9-5, they did a C5, C6 laminectomy. His right femur repair is currently on hold. Skin wise, he has the X fix still in place. He has a posterior neck island dressing. There are staples in place and his dressing is clean, dry, and intact. He also has generalized bruising. Lines, he has a right subclavian triple lumen and he has a left AC 18 gauge. We already spoke about drips. Family-wise, he has a wife, her name is Sue and she is the point of contact. He does have elderly children but they have not had communication with them for many years. As far as DC planning, we are currently pending a discussion with his wife to see what we are gonna do with his continued plan of care. Things to do are pending an MRI of the brain, but we have to wait for the X fix to be removed. We are currently replacing his potassium. This morning, his potassium level was 2.7. I've already given two bags of 20 MEQs of potassium, so you have two more to give. We'll also need magnesium because his magnesium level today was 1.8. His other electrolytes have been stable. Consults on board, he has ortho, Dr. Bone, neuro, Dr. Brain, and cardio, Dr. Heart. We are to call Dr. Heart if his heart rate is sustained greater than 120 for more than 10 minutes. That did occur overnight. He was in the high 140s and that's when we got the AMIO initiated. If his heart rate increases again over 120, go ahead and give Dr. Hart a call. He did receive acetaminophen times two for his temperatures. You can give another dose at about 1030. That's all I have for you. Do you have any questions? All right, I hope you have a good shift. Make sure you check down in my description box. I do offer one-on-one -on -one bedside shift report coaching. So make sure you schedule your appointment with me. It is virtual, so don't worry about being in a different state. We can still do the coaching together. You will get one-on-one -on -one practice, plus ask unlimited amount of questions that you may have. As always, I hope this information was beneficial to you. Make sure you subscribe to the channel so that you don't miss out on any uploads. And until next time, all love.